Mother Anne Marie is a graduate of Benedictine College where she studied secondary education and English. She has taught both theology and English for 14 years to middle school and high school students. She completed her master's in theology from Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College in 2016. Elected as Mother Superior to the Marian Sisters of the Diocese of Lincoln in 2018. She is a sports fan who enjoys reading, knitting, and being with her sisters. Please uh, help me welcome Reverend Mother Anne Marie. They, they always ask for a little bio, and it's always hard to write about yourself, but, but it is very true. So um, I'm really grateful to be here, and I know we just began with a, a most beautiful prayer of the Mass, but let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, teach me how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, like uh, Deacon said, my name is Mother Anne Marie. I'm a married sister from the Diocese otherwise known as the other Marian Sisters. Um, uh, when you Google Marian Sisters, you get two choices, California or Nebraska, so you get confused, uh, one state or the other. And uh, it's been commented that I'm too young to be a, a mother superior, but just so you can figure out the math here. I've been in the convent for 23 years. I've been in vows for 21. I was blessed to make vows during the Jubilee year of 2000. Um, I've been teaching for 14 years, and I've been Mother Superior for the last four. Uh, I truly enjoyed if any of you were here yesterday for the teacher's uh, workshop. I, was, I, was, I really enjoyed being back in the classroom again, something that uh, I miss greatly. But I, I get to teach the postulants or the novices, and so that was a wonderful experience that I enjoyed. But with all of those numbers and doing all of that math, I will tell you, I still have a lot to learn. So everything that I'm going to speak of to you today about uh, just what I've learned in my experience. I don't consider myself um, an expert in prayer. God bless Deacon for, for putting all that pressure. <laughs> uh, for putting all that pressure on the priests and the sisters to um, be somehow experts in prayer. But I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit uh, in my talk. So just a little bit about, a little bit more about myself and maybe my spirituality and where I'm coming from. As Marian sisters, we follow the rule of St. Francis. We have a lot of great Dominicans here yesterday, and today you'll hear from some Dominicans and some Jesuits as well. Um, but as Franciscans, there, there's many different saints out there that offer many different spiritualities and can affect your, your prayer life differently. But Francis had um, a very human aspect, a human outlook to the spiritual life. He experienced the humanity of Jesus in a very real way. We have the stigmata, uh, the nativity, even hearing the voice of God to, to, to rebuild his church. So Francis and his very human aspect um, of, of spirituality has affected my prayer and in turn uh, all Franciscans. Also, they mentioned uh, that I am a sports fan. Uh, sister asked me a question today about the Nebraska Cornhuskers. And I knew the answer off the top of my head. And I said, is that sad? I feel like that's kind of sad. She said, no, you're a fan. I said, I know, I am a fan. So uh, mostly baseball, football, American football, uh, and basketball. And I find the things that I have learned through sports, you know, it's challenges, it's rules, the nuance of things. I can draw many analogies um, in my own life and, and specifically to prayer. So I'll speak to that. Also, I'm a teacher, so be before uh, becoming a community superior, I taught theology and English. So, if there is an 
an obscure passage in scripture, I probably know it. If there's an obscure saint that said something inspirational, um, I definitely have a tendency to cling to that. My favorite um, has always been early American literature. I find that um, our founding fathers um, are almost like the church fathers of our country, uh, kind of like we, we treat the church fathers of our faith. So they have a lot of wonderful things to say. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, I'm a Zerky. That's my last name, is Zerky. Uh, it's German. And I know out here in uh, California that doesn't mean a lot. Bishop can tell you what it means. It means to be a Zerky. He knows my family. Um, but we are, we're all products of our family. We're all products of our upbringing. And so just to give you a little background, my dad is a Protestant convert, very extroverted Marine. And my mom is an introverted New Yorker, cradle Catholic, um, with a little bit of hippie in her. Um, not like these new hipsters that we have. I'm talking like the, the original hippies. She, they met here in California, because my dad was stationed out here as a Marine, and she was out here being a hippie. So, you know, how we ended up in Nebraska is a whole other story. So, my family traits, um, people will say, are definitely practicality, uh, blunt. I like to be straightforward. Um, and uh, patriotic and very faithful to very faithful to the Catholic Church. So just so you know what you're getting when, when you hear me speak. Um, before speaking of the practical, before we jump into the practical, you know, how to model it, how to uh, encourage it, and how to include it, we need to just talk about prayer in general. Um, so for, as an English teacher, I look at St. Paul, and he's the patron saint of run-on sentences, right? When you're reading those and you look and you're just like, where? Is there, where's the verb, what is he modifying, where is he going, at least that's my English brain I look at. And so he will go on and on, these long sentences on, on the mystery of a man and his wife and loving the church, and he just goes on and on, and, and in the end he'll just say, well, it's a mystery. Okay? But at least we have something to draw from it. But when it comes to prayer, what do we get? Two words, pray always. That's it. No explanation, no when, no where, no how, nothing. Now, it is the end of his letter to the Thessalonians. It's the very end. And so I feel like he was kind of rushed. Like he had this long list of things he wanted to talk about, but he didn't have a chance to get to it. So he says, pray always. Uh, in all circumstances, give thanks. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecy, test everything, retain what is good, and don't do anything at all. Thank you for coming. Right? Like, that was kind of the end of his letter. It, he probably could have written run-on sentences for all of those things. Um, but when it comes to prayer, we get pray always. That's it. So we are left to our own devices to figure, to figure it out. Um, not necessarily. We have the, the wisdom of the church. Um, we have saints. We have uh, many practical things that we can include about what it means to pray and how to pray always. So, first of all, some common errors when it comes to prayer and comes to um, praying always. First of all, people will say it's impossible. It's psychologically impossible to pray always. St. Thomas Aquinas said, you can't think about two things at the same time. So how am I supposed to wash dishes and praise God at the same time? Okay? Or, or um, how, how am I supposed to teach a class you know, and, and have the presence of God in the back of my mind? Now, I love it when little kids will ask the sisters, what do you do all day? And let's be honest, we get that from curious adults as well. What do sisters do all day? You have that thought in your mind. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a little insight into a typical day. Now, I am a mother superior. It's a little different for uh, just a, a regular sister. But in one day, I can uh, drive a sister or multiple sisters to doctor's appointments. I can answer some emails. Uh, I talked to our maintenance man about a building project. I went for a walk. That usually just means going to the end of the driveway to pick up the mail. Um, but took care of the medical needs of one of our sisters, returned some books to the public library, made some appointments on the phone, assigned some cars to the sisters who were going out the next day. We had a sister who had a birthday, so we 
celebrated her birthday, eating treats, we watched a movie, I washed dishes at lunch and supper, and, and that doesn't include, you know, going to mass and getting my regular prayers in um, and praying and praying with the community. So if, that, if that's my list of things to do, I know any vocation, you could just list your things that you do during the day, like, sister, do you pray all day? And my answer is usually, I wish. I wish. I wish that all I did all day was pray. So people are right. It is physically, it's maybe psychologically impossible, right? To pray. Always. But I don't, I don't think that is the case. We are body and soul. It's the way that God made us, and we can't live pure spirit. So we'll get back to that. The second error is that maybe it's not necessary. Maybe you don't have to be on your knees in a chapel saying a Hail Mary all the time, right? Um, in fact, maybe all those things that I do, that, that could be my prayer. You've heard the common phrase, right? My work is my prayer. Maybe that's what St. Paul meant when he said to pray always. But I caution you into this dangerous area that we have a tendency to fall into, that maybe my prayer is only effective as my work is productive. So if you haven't done anything by the end of the day, maybe you feel like your prayer is not as productive. And as a society, I feel like we've kind of fallen into this lie that our value lies in our productivity. Okay? I try to explain contemplative religious life to any average person, and they will say, but what do they do? And you're just like, well, they pray. And I know, it, but, they, but they want, everybody wants to know, but what do you do? So it's not true that necessarily your work is your only prayer. So the question is, if physically I can't be praying all the time, and I can't just let my work be my prayer, then maybe this whole pray always isn't for everyone. And I should just succumb to the fact that this is one of the many challenges in the Bible that the Lord places before me that I'm going to be utterly inadequate at. I should just realize that. That prayer isn't for everybody. It's probably not for me. I should probably leave prayer to the masters. You know, those monks, those contemplative nuns, the heavy hitters, you know, those uh, super prayers, the grandparents or great-grandparents in their recliners with their giant stacks of holy cards that pray for the world and keep things moving all day. We'll just let them handle the prayer always. It's not true. It's definitely not true. St. Paul was not writing to a cloistered convent of nuns or to a local retirement community. He was writing to a growing, vibrant, young, and active church. So, we all need to take this to heart. This is the last time my extended family was all together. In fact, it was yesterday, five years ago, that my brother got married to his wonderful bride, Brenda. Okay? And if you look at this group of a family, okay, you'd say, who's the prayer? Who's the prayer for this family? Who keeps things going, right? That's me. Everybody be like, oh, it's so nice you have a religious in the family. I bet she just prays for you all day long. And I will say no. The answer is no. We all know, this whole group of people knows, that the prayer in the family is that woman right there. That's my older sister, Mel. She is a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade religious education teacher. She teaches at St. Peter and Paul in Omaha, and she has done so longer than I have. She cares for those kids. She has like 16 godchildren and 10 confirmation sponsors. She's got three sons speed dial. They call her up for everything. She is the prayer. It's not necessarily me. Just because I wear this doesn't mean I am the heavy hitter of the prayer in the family. So keep that in mind that it's, it's not always who you think uh, is called to be doing the pray always. We are all called to pray always. So. Bishop made a great, um, a great plug for the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I would recommend um, reading that if you can. The section on prayer is beautiful. Even if you just read the quotes, what the saints have to say about prayer, or the scriptural reference to pray, it is, it is absolutely beautiful. So there's some great information in there. But the most important thing that I want you to remember is that prayer is not all on us. We often think that if I pray more, if I pray harder, it would be more effective. 
I would feel a difference. Okay? And it's not true. Yes, we are called to pray, but it's from the Holy Spirit. God does the work in us. We're called to holiness, and our very act of being created calls us to search out the Creator to do that work. But our Creator is so much more than the idols and the gods of the Old Testament who are just kind of out there making us do the work. He is searching for us. And that is what is unique about our story, is that He is searching for us. One of my favorite stories uh, from the Old Testament is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You know this story? It's in 1 Kings 18. Um, it's basically the Old Testament version of a reality TV show, Whose God is Better, right? And so he says, um, if, if your God is truly the God, I'll follow him. Okay, prove it, though. They set up an altar with a sacrifice. No fire, though, of course, in California, no fire. So the prayer is to, you know, call upon your God and allow him to consume the sacrifice. And I'll call upon my God and allow him to consume my sacrifice. And whoever's God shows up, that's the God I will follow. So the prophets of Baal are praying. They say they're in this trance, the state of prayer. They're slashing themselves. They're throwing blood on the altar. And they're calling out to their God in prayer. And at this point, Elijah kind of mocks them and says, you know, oh, call louder. He's God. He's far away. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's out doing, they say, his business, God's stuff, whatever God does. Okay? Um, and so they try and they try and they try, and obviously their God does not show up. So it's this idea that could God get tired of us? Is God too busy to hear our prayers? We are his children. Could he ever forget us and, and ignore our prayers? This is not true. So we know how the story ends, right? Elijah even pours water on the sacrifice, and it just gets consumed, just like that, just by the mention of God's name. But after that, Elijah goes into hiding. The truth is, God seeks us out. We can forget him. We can hide our face from him. We can run away. But... He will never forget us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, The living and true God tirelessly calls each person to the mysterious encounter known as prayer. So prayer is a mysterious encounter. He initiates it. His love initiates it to come first. The question is, do we know what his call is? sounds like when he calls each person to prayer. Do we know what it is? Now, when I think of um, the call, you all oftentimes think of uh, vocations, but in my head, I think of uh, sports, right? The call's coming in. What's the play going to be? You think about football, you know, they're holding up signs, or they, they run a person in, and it's like all in code. You know, I don't even know what it means. It's like Carolina 45 right? Like, what, what does that mean? I don't know. But they know. And they yell it out. You know, they, and they yell it out so everybody knows what it is. It's very loud and vocal. Also in Nebraska, we do have a volleyball team that's really good. And they're always yelling, right? The coaches are always like, communicate. Communicate with each other. They're yelling at each other. They want everybody to know what's going on. Well, one of my favorite sports when it comes to the call is baseball. Okay? The coach from the dugout can't just yell to the hitter. You know, burnt, right? Because that's just going to give it away. He can't say, swing at anything, you know, because we're ahead. It's so subtle, right? Sometimes it's just like a brush of a shoulder or a, a, an itch on the nose. But if you're a player of the game, you know what to look for. You know what to look for. So the players know. Even if you get in trouble, you steal the other team's signs, right? Okay? So Elijah, remember Elijah? He knew what to look for. Uh, the story, the story is he goes up into, he goes up into the cave, right? He goes up into Mount Carmel, and and the angel 
says, go out to the camp where the Lord is passing by. And there's this huge earthquake, and rocks are falling, and wind, and uh, fire. All these wonderful signs that you would think would show the power of God. But God is not in the wind, and God is not in the earthquake, and God is not in the fire. And finally he hears a tiny whispering sound. And he covers his face when he recognizes God in that tiny whispering sound. So we know that he knew that if he could hear this tiny sound. Now don't be afraid, like, if I don't hear the sound, I'm going to miss it. Right? But oftentimes, we want sky writing. We would prefer, a, you know, a, an act of God to answer our prayers and to know that he is present. Okay? But oftentimes, if we're players of the game, we know, we know what he sounds like. And that is really what prayer is. So there's a difference between the acts of prayer, which are important, right? You need to go to Mass on Sunday. You need to um, pray your rosary. These are important things, okay? But actions of prayer are different than praying always. So if you were to ask a, a person the definition of prayer, they would say, oh, prayer is the lifting of your heart and mind to God. It's a conversation with God. It's asking for things. And this is all true. But these are actions. And if we just stay here, okay, then it's a little bit difficult to move deeper into our relationship with so praying always is living in such a way that your heart and your mind are lifted by everything. Everything that you encounter is an opportunity to lift your soul to God. And this only happens if you have an increased awareness of his presence in your life, in a, a, a state of dependency on him for everything. So I am working on this uh, increased awareness of God in my life. It's something that you're constantly working on. Okay? If you forget, then it all depends on you, and then things fall apart, and then you're in trouble. But if you're constantly aware and depend upon his presence, your life will change, and everything turns into basically a miracle. So um, even just this trip out here today, uh, this weekend for us, it was kind of a, a step of faith, leaving the sisters behind, not knowing you know, what, what the situation was going to be, Giving, giving a talk. And so there are a lot of things along the way where the Lord's like, I'm going to take care of you. Okay? So going through security as a sister in an airport is always an adventure. You never know if they're going to pull you aside. You try to empty as many pockets as you can. But eventually, you know, you're going to get pulled aside. That's just how it goes. But guess who got to go through? Like, green. Green light. Didn't, didn't get patted down or anything. My other sister, Sister Serena, she got pulled. So, so I just was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. We rented a car, which I heard is a big deal around here to get a car. We got a free upgrade. Who's going to say no to that? Like, do you want a free upgrade? No. We want the one. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. We got a free upgrade. Wonderful living conditions. The sisters gave us a wonderful home. And also, just driving up here yesterday, I don't know why you have Canadian geese up here in, in California, but you do. And geese have always been a sign in my life of God's of God loving me. It takes me back to a time in my childhood when I just felt protected and loved in my family. We would go watch the geese uh, migrate, something we do in the Midwest, and it's just beautiful. And so when I was just coming around the curb on the field there, it was just full of Canadian geese. And I'm sure you all have some other thoughts about why there are all these geese on your field and what they were doing to your field. But they weren't there today. So, so the Lord was saying, I am here, and, and you need to be aware of my presence. So if I can go through life with that, I'm going to live in a state of prayer, as opposed to feeling like I just have to pray, kneel down all the time. So can you imagine being... You know, this again, another example of, of uh, these acts of prayer versus the state of prayer. Can you imagine if, if a wife just went through the actions, making the sandwiches, doing the laundry, picking up the kids from school, but in her heart, she just felt like a slave, right? She didn't, she just did it because it was what was expected of her. 
So that is like a, an example of just acting out your prayer versus someone who does it out of love. Puts the love notes in the, in the lunch boxes, you know, or folds that laundry with care. You do it out of love. And that's the difference between these actions um, and, and the state of prayer. So if, if you are constantly just kind of acting, it's easy to become resentful. Like the Lord's not hearing my prayers, or I just prayed one Hail Mary, or I just didn't make another holy hour, then the world would change or something like that, or my life would be better. But it's not always the case. So so it's, it's about creating a relationship with God, and that could be a whole other talk, which Sister Serena is going to talk on later, so shame, shameless plug for Sister Serena's talk, about a relationship with God and what that looks like. Um, another famous story about act and action that circulates um, is one of Mother Teresa. And we're not all called to be missionaries of charity, again, right? Uh, this is a reminder of the Lord meets us where we are. But one day, um, a rich man was touring her house for the sick and the dying. Uh, and they came to a sister who was picking bugs and maggots out of a, of a wounded man. Because this is what they do. They take the sick and the dying off the streets and they care for them. And this rich man looked at the sister and said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa responded, neither would I. So it's necessary to perform the act, but the importance comes from the state of why you are performing the act. She wouldn't do it for a million dollars either, because that's not why she was doing it. So how do we go from this act of prayer to being in a state of prayer? Very good question. I'm sure there's a talk on that somewhere. So thank you all for coming and all of that. <laughs> um, I would go to that talk. That would be great. Um, this is where the 2,000 year tradition of the church is very helpful and the wisdom of the saints, right? Paul kind of left us hanging, pray always. But there are some things, and I will try to be practical. Um, but I, I do want to remember my experience comes from being a religious sister. And I know that while there are religious sisters here, you come from busy lives and you come from families. Um, and so what works for me or what works in my classroom wouldn't necessarily work for you. So um, I just say there are some things that are universal and I'll try to speak to those. First off is silence. How can you hear the small, whispering sound of God if your environment is full of noise? Um, and there is uh, a piece of wisdom from a French philosopher that said, all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone. And I think that he was a long time ago. <laughs> he was before all of the noise that we have in our world today. Um, several hundred years later, C.S. Lewis uh, kind of finished off the thoughts for this. And he said, we live, in fact, in a world starved for solitude, silence, and private, and therefore starved for meditation and true friendship. How do you cultivate silence in your life? It, it takes an act of the will a real self-sacrifice to be silent, to not turn on the radio, to not turn on the TV, to not pop in the earbuds or whatever it is. We oftentimes even use noise to drown out the noise, right? You'll, you will maybe listen to music because you don't want to hear the background while you're trying to work on something else. And I'll admit I'm guilty. Just writing this talk, I, I popped in the headphones as well. So we use noise to, to drown out the noise. And it is so important to have silence in our life. Um, one experience that I had uh, with silence when I was younger, I worked at the zoo. Because, you know, that's something people do with little kids. I worked at the Lincoln Children's Zoo uh, in the summer when I was in high school. And this was before cell phones and iPods. So it was a lot of fun to be around the animals and little kids. And to introduce them to a world that they, they never would before. Um, and we would get 
get there early in the mornings before the zoo opened, usually to do some cleaning. And it wasn't so bad for a high school kid because you were with other high school kids and, and you, got, you got to do stuff together. But this one particular time, um, I was assigned to the reptile house. Long, long row of windows, like the fingerprints up to here, because you know, all the kids are sticking their hands on. So it was my job in the morning to go through and to clean off all the fingerprints. Uh, on the windows, and I got the assignment by myself. So I thought, oh, this is gonna be the worst morning ever. So I start cleaning the windows, and um, I had kind of timed myself, and it was like an Our Father and a Hail Mary and a Glory be for, for each window, to, to do each window. And as I'm moving down, as I'm moving down, um, I, I realized that I didn't mind being alone, that I enjoyed the quiet prayer, and that uh, I I wasn't so much focused anymore on the Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, but I was actually having a conversation with God, and I enjoyed it. Now, at that point in time in high school, I was more freaked out by the fact that I enjoyed it, because maybe if I enjoyed praying, I'm supposed to be a nun or something like that, and that was not on my radar, or not something I definitely wanted to do just then. So, in today's age, it's easy to break silence, both internally and externally, but there are ways to include it in your day. Don't be afraid of silence in your house. Turn off that TV, turn off the radio in your cars. Traffic is something I'm not used to out here. We've had a wonderful experience with that, but you have a lot of time to be quiet in your cars while you're driving. So seek it out. Create spaces in your life where you can be present to God, but more importantly, in that silence where God can be present to you. In this way, you can work to be prayerful. So in this way, prayerful, being praying always is a generous fulfillment of, of God's presence in our life. So when you do your duties in silence, you can allow him, allow him to speak to you. Um, just kind of as an aside, this is really just an aside. If you find that um, distraction is is a trouble when you pray, especially being silent, like the bishop talked about this battle, I would encourage you to include some more physical aspects to your prayer: kneeling, standing in a posture of praise going for a walk, a silent walk, moving around, um, genuflecting, the cruciform uh, way to pray. So all of those uh, physical aspects can really kind of help you just engage in those moments of silence uh, and, and take those on. I also find those particularly helpful if you want to teach those to your kids in your classroom. Like, we're going to say a prayer of praise. I want you all on your feet. Thank you, Lord. Okay? Or, or we're going to ask for intercession. We're going to kneel humbly before God. So to include those things um, and really to teach people, because we are body and soul, what that can do and how can that affect our prayer. Um, so now I want to get to a little bit of practical. The title was Modeling, Encouraging, and Including uh, Prayer in Your Lives. So modeling prayer, if you can move from the state of just praying, saying prayers, to being a, a prayerful person who's always in the state of prayer, looking for uh, where God is working in your life and praising Him for that, then modeling prayer happens naturally. Okay? And my, my main encouragement is to be genuine about it. If you tell someone else how to pray, but you are not praying yourselves, they'll be able to tell right away. So, so I encourage you just to be genuine. And also be genuine and real in your prayer. It's not for show. It's not for other people. It's, it's just you and God. And so this will definitely have an effect. Um, once, once He's a venerable. He's not a saint. But um, a man that I've been getting to know a little bit is a priest by the name of Father Patrick Peyton. He died in the 1990s. But he was an Irish priest uh, who started the Rosary Crusades. Uh, you might be more familiar with one of his quotes. The family that prays together stays together. So that this is him. This is Father Patrick Payton. 
Um, as a young boy growing up in Ireland, he experienced prayer in a very profound way, and then he goes on to become a priest. He comes to America and starts this radio show and a TV show, and everybody who was anybody, famous people, he was the king of the cold call. He would just call up Bing Crosby or Lucille Ball and get them to come promote the rosary on his show. And so just growing up, he, this is what he says. He says, every night I would hear my mother call us to prayer, and then my father would lead us in the rosary. To see a man who lived totally what he believed left an impression on me, even as a little child, that I could not erase. So, I usually use this quote when I speak to men's groups, um, but I think it, it works for everyone. When someone sees you pray truly from the heart what you believe, it will leave an impression on them. So your children in the classroom, your family members, your friends, your parishioners. This is why I can say, and I, I don't want to speak for priests, but I know uh, a holy family, a family that prays, helps me in my vocation. Because it is so, um, it's so impactful. And it's something that, that you can't remember, you can't forget. And this is just a shameless plug. There is a, a documentary about Father Patrick Payton. It's called Pray. It tells the story of his life and his uh, Rosary Crusades um, and, and really what the, what the nation needs right now. You can find it on Amazon from Pretty So I remember being a kid um, and encountering uh, and seeing my family pray. Um, one time, my older sister, that one that I circled there, the true prayer, we were driving around uh, town and we passed a church, and she made the sign of the cross. And I felt so uncomfortable. Like, just walked into confessional and someone else was in there. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. I really, I felt like I was going to enter. I was, I, I, I just, I didn't know what to do. And then at, at that point, we were so far down the street, if, if I did it, it would just look like I was just doing what she did, you know, because they were not by the church anymore. So I, I really didn't know what to do. Later in life, after I was kind of reflecting about this incident, because obviously it has stayed with me, uh, I came to two conclusions. And one is that I felt like I had interrupted her moment of prayer, right? Like she is in that place of prayer where she, she recognizes the presence of God at every moment. And I had in, intruded on that. And um, also how important it is to, to talk about prayer. Um, I did never ask her why she did that. She never taught me to do that. Um, but I think that that is uh, a real important part of modeling prayer. That would have been a great opportunity for her to, to teach me a little bit about recognizing God wherever you are. It's important to talk about. Um, nothing encourages me more, like I said, in my own vocation, when I hear my family, my brother, who has four kids under four, say, well, in my holy hour, I was praying about this. Or, um, you know, my saint for this year is John Vianney. I'm like, do you have a saint for the year? I thought, I, you know, these, these are, uh, you know, my late family. Um, I usually don't hear whatever else it is that they're saying. So caught up in the fact that they are praying, um, but even in the convent, uh, we have a sister. All our sisters are holy; they're they're wonderful sisters. But she has a habit of when she sits down at the sewing machine to start on a project, she'll make the sign of the cross. If she sits down at the computer to do something; she makes the sign of the cross. Just the other day, I was walking through the kitchen. My sister was cleaning the grapes and plucking them off and washing them. And every, she was just saying, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, as she plucked off every single one. <clears throat> and so these genuine acts of prayer are so moving to me and so encouraging, and I know that they can be encouraging for others. So when we talk about modeling prayer, encouraging prayer, and including prayer in our life, the interesting thing is you can talk about it at any point. Someone, I think it was the bishop yesterday, talked about how it's 
cyclical, the cyclical, right? We live how we pray, we pray how we live. So if you are including prayer in your own life, it's easy to model, and then you encourage others. Or if you're modeling prayer, it's going to encourage others um, to include it in their own life. So you really can, can start this conversation um, from any point, um, but I just chose to start with, with modeling, a little bit of including. But when it comes to encouraging prayer in other people's lives, um, first of all, it's important to remember that it's about a relationship with God. It's about a relationship with God. And not to be afraid. Not to be afraid of God. Fear steals our, atti steals our attitude of prayerfulness. Fear steals a lot of things. I think we've experienced that in the last year, what fear can do for us. So don't be afraid of what others might say or what they might think, um, especially when it comes to encouraging prayer. Um, it's a great tactic of the enemy to um, make this, uh, to make you afraid to encourage others to pray. Um, it, can, it can really, it can really uh, kind of paralyze. When it comes to including prayer, um, there's a, there are so many things that you can do, um, and that I would encourage to include uh, an attitude of prayerfulness. I have found that the simple decade of the rosary takes an app, it takes a minute and thirty seconds really to pray those ten hail marys. So if you ever find yourself in a stressful situation or a need to pull aside, just to take that minute and to reground yourself, um, that that, including that in your life. Also, when it comes to talking to other people, learn vocabulary of prayer. You're going to hear a lot of different words today about Marian prayer, Ignatian prayer, different things like that. Things like um, consolation, desolation, meditation. These are vocabulary of prayer that I think that we can incorporate in our daily life that would be very helpful to encouraging others to pray, okay? Um, you can't just assume someone knows what a spiritual reading book is, okay? Talk to them about the saints and the lives of the saints and how to encourage, encourage that and include that in your daily life. Um, silence is key. Helping people make silence, especially in your classrooms or in your catechetical moments. Hey, just like I did at the very beginning, Lord, teach me to pray, and then silence. Allow the Lord to speak. Allow the Lord to move uh, in that area and in that area of your heart. Um, the liturgy is a perfect place. If you're trying to include more prayer in your life, you don't have to make it up. You don't have to start over. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to say. The church and its richness has, has this cycle of prayer that is so incredibly beautiful. Um, you've got the highs and the lows of Jesus and Mary's life, the excitement, the waiting, the pause, the silence. So we can't just enter into that. Right now we're in ordinary time. We're towards the end of the ordinary time, which means we're going to be talking about ending things. Okay, It's perfect for harvest season and, and just kind of ending, ending this time in the end world and what that looks like. So these are all things that we can um, include in our life to help us become more prayerful people. So I just want to um, conclude with encouraging you to be true prayers. Um, to allow the Lord to speak to your heart um, and to know that He wants a relationship with you. He wants to clear the clutter. He wants to get rid of the lies. He wants just to speak with you. And if you can create that relationship with the Lord in your life, it will overflow into everything you do. Not necessarily just your catechetical work, but your family, your job, the everyday duties that you do around the house. It's not easy but it is worth it. Okay. You're not going to get to the pearly gates and the Lord's going to say, well, if you just would have said one more Hail Mary, maybe I can get you an upgrade. Okay? 
He's not going to say that. He wants to know you. And that's not what you're going to be doing in heaven either. Right? Your heaven is a continuation of the relationship that you have formed with the Lord on this earth. We get to start now as religious. That's why we're eschatological signs, right? We get to start that now. But it's not just for us, it's for you. And you can be great prayers, and you can pray always. Okay? So it's not impossible, it's not impractical, and it is for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>